much better than the degree in the name. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we come here this evening to be refreshed, <clears throat> to feel your breeze of comfort, to enter your presence and to encounter you. Lord, we come <clears throat> before you this evening with the busyness of our day. We hunger to, to in some way, learn something that would impact our lives in a way that would actually improve the quality of how we live. Yet this can only be realized to the extent that we experience communion with you. And therefore we look to your scriptures and we look to your servant St. Peter to reveal to us the path, Lord, to a walk with you. This evening we come before you and we lift before you our spouses, our children, our loved ones, those who have come to us to seek prayer, those who are tormented, and seek relief, that you would hear our prayers, that you would give us the grace to give the proper response to them, the proper guidance and direction. And be with us, Lord, as we embark on our studies and as we strive to, to put on the mind of Christ. Help us, Lord, to properly construct ourselves in the truth of the Holy Faith. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, summer's over. <laughs> kind of, I guess, you know, we could say. Well, it's still kind of hot. Thank you for coming. Um, we're on the regular pattern. We're going to be meeting for Tuesday nights, 7, 10 p.m. We're staggered a little bit because I have the Inquirer's class before this. And I just want to encourage you. I just want to thank you for coming. Um, I know you have other choices. You have other things that you can do. And um, anything that we do to, to enhance our spiritual lives, through placing them in the scriptures, we're going to benefit. Irregardless of, of, um, of our personal struggles, they will improve when we make it a pattern to bring them to the scriptures and to prayer. We will grow. Even if we find ourselves in the midst of a passion in which we are struggling with an addictive pattern, God can help us. It takes time. You know, because passions just don't happen overnight. They can happen over months and years. And so we have to be patient as God heals us. Whether it be an issue of jealousy or pride or lust or greed, whatever it is, be patient with yourselves. Don't give up. And um, the Lord is loving. He's merciful. And as long as we sincerely say we're sorry, it doesn't mean we're not going to fall or repeat you know, the same sin many times. Don't give up. Um, God is here for the long haul with you and, and just be resolved that you're going to continue continue to just to cooperate and um, a monk once went to his his, uh, his spiritual father and said you know I keep falling into in the same type of sins and you know I'm just I just feel so distraught and, and despairing and he said you know when Jesus comes back surely I'll be I'll be judged I'll be condemned and this wise spiritual father said to him you know Pray that when you come, when the Lord comes back, you will have come out of confession. You'll be standing upright before it. And that's all you have to do. Just pray that when the Lord comes back, that you'll have completed your confession. And that's what all we, we do. You know, that's why you know, keep a priest close to you. <laughs> so <we> can, hey. <laughs> you know, no, I don't want to get a bunch of phone calls when we're having a monsoon hit the belly. <laughs> you know, okay, but, but you know what I mean. I'm glad you're here, and I'm excited because anytime I open the scriptures, it's just as much a journey for me as it is for you, and we are in this discovery together. You know, it's kind of like this old ride I like at Disneyland. What's it called? The Jungle Safari? Huh? Remember that ride, honey? My kids would hate it because I was the only one who liked going on it. It was the same. Jungle you know, Yeah, Jungle whatever. It was the same slapstick humor. You know, the you remember all the lines, you know, about the Nile and... And, and 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 the guy holding the the head and and uh, yeah, yeah, the head on it. And um, but you know I enjoy learning and uh, and it's it's fun that we can do it together. And so I'm here as a guide who has the hopefully the wisdom of the church and enough bruises <coughs> to know enough to protect us from danger <coughs> to at least open the path to discover. And that's what I want to do tonight. Today we're in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, 
And I'm going to start right with verse 1 here. And we're going to see how far we get. <coughs> but these were also, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them, and be in and bring on themselves swift destruction. But there were also false prophets among the people. Now, who might St. Peter be referring to here <coughs> as the false prophets that were among the people in his day? You mentioned Simon? Okay, Simon Magus, okay. And what was Simon's uh, distortion? What was he teaching? <coughs> Those are the inquirers' class, I don't know, Magus. They just learned it so they can show what they know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they are part of it, given the cheat sheet. Okay. Yeah. What is Simon? How does Simon that just try to deceive the people? Sorcery. Sorcery. He was a magician. Okay. And what he did is he tried to uh, deceive people through false magic that was given to him from the power of demons. In fact, in Eusebius' church history, the first history book of the church, Simon was being climbed to the, the tallest building in Rome and stepped off, and the demons had suspended him in the air. It was that night. Peter knew that it was the demons that had suspended him, and he prayed that the, so the people would not be deceived, the simple-minded, that the demons would let go. And when that happened, Simon Magus collapsed to his death. He didn't die immediately, but he died slowly. But yet, it protected the people from the deception. Now, what other false prophets um, were there in the Old Testament before this? Can you think of, of false teachers from the Old Testament? Do you remember the worship of the fertility god Baal? B-A-A-L? In 1 Kings, there's a story in which there were 50 false prophets of Baal in 1 Kings, chapter 18. Do you remember that story? How Elijah was being tested and, and he had the, the false, you know, the, these priests tried to, to um, you know, to, to pray that um, God would ca cause their sacrifice to be, to be burned up and that nothing happened. And then Elijah had them put all kinds of kindling in a place and pour water, gallons of water over it to make sure that it would certainly not carry a charge. And then Elijah called down the fire of heaven, and then all the, the all the false prophets of Baal certainly came to a, a quick conclusion of their life at that point. And you see other stories, you know, in the, you know Hananiah and Jeremiah 28, 4. And there were the 400 false prophets of Asherah, in 1 Kings, Kings 18, 19. There's a story of Balaam in Numbers 22, verses 5. He said he was sent by Balak to, um, you know, to try to um, counter Israel. And all these went through various things, okay? God, God stopped their efforts, and he, and he held them off. And just a, a point for us uh, to take note. Um, have you ever wondered in uh, when you've read the, the book of Acts and you've heard references to, to various groups at the, at the time of, of the first century Christ and the things that they did? You remember the name uh, Theodos, Theodos, who actually had a following by the Jordan River. This is revealed in Acts chapter 5. And how the Jews went against him and, and stopped his efforts because he was considered to be a false prophet. There was a Egyptian in book in, in Acts chapter 21, and his name was and he was put down by Felix, put him down um, to uh, put down his uprising. He had twenty thousand followers that followed him, an Egyptian, okay, who had this movement, and yet. Judaism and Rome put put them down, okay, and so there are all kinds of false groups and false kind of self-appointed leaders who created these these followings based on some false 
prophecy or theology. And this was very prevalent throughout the annals of the history of Judaism and Christianity. These groups surfaced from time to time. It was very common. And who were these prophets influenced by? Where did their influence come from? Satan. Satan. Okay, the deceiver. In fact, it's very, you know, some of the titles that we get from, um, you know, from the very meaning of uh, Satanas, you know, the deceiver. You know, it reveals what they do. The people, somebody might be given some special gifts from evil, and there are evil powers that people will today. People who make covenants and promises to the devil can be given some type of evil power to some extent, okay? In exchange for their soul, they're given perhaps fame, perhaps wealth. And how many of the modern music performing off, music performing uh, performers today do you hear have done that very thing? Who have sold their soul to the devil? How many do you think? Can you name a few? Yes, I could. Okay. Uh, you got Beyonce, yeah. uh, the people that had literally spoke on television saying they have given their soul. Okay. Uh, um, there's others out there. I, mm -hmm. Rihanna, I think, is, yeah. she said also she, uh, Nicki Minaj, I don't know how to say their names correctly. Yeah, okay. She has said, uh -huh. it just goes on a list. And okay. That's, and, and, and so, you know, we think this is trite. We think it's, well, you know, you know. Yeah, you know, it's just you know you're just kind of saying it, but you know there's serious consequences to doing that type of thing. He's just playing with fire like that is yeah tempting. It's yeah, dangerous. And yet our young people are very much tempted to make oaths to the devil in order that they might be able to find something that will give them a sting. This this happens. It happens within our own church, where our young people are subject to these same influences. These, these same type of false prophets and, and promises to receive some type of recognition or greatness that they don't think they can receive through just, you know, cooperating with God. And so the demons were definitely involved here. The, and why, so the demon, why were they subject to the influence of demons? Why were they subject? What uh, predisposed them to being subject to the demonic? What do you think? What do you think? Could it be like the sin of pride and like them being selfish? Okay, okay. Okay, their pride. And their pride predisposed them to the temptation of what? What were they looking for? Power. Power. Great. What else? Money. Money. Fame, self-importance. I want to be important. I want to be special. In vain glory, you know. I want to receive the recognition and the adulation that comes from other people. And this motivates them. So the demons, being of the angelic order, although fallen, have an entire have a higher intelligence than us. Do you realize that? They have a t higher intelligence. This is why the church fathers are very careful. They tell you, do not engage a demon in terms of dialogue. You're not supposed to. Why? Because they will trap you and convince you okay. to uh, follow their teaching. Mm -hmm. They'll distort the Bible and the true word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember, because the demons, didn't they try to do this with Jesus when he was tempted on the mount? You know, you know, the Lord said he would, you know, throw yourself on his mouth. The Lord said he would trust his angels, you know, to, to catch you. So nothing would, so you would not have your, your heel hit on any stone. And yet he was correct. The devil was quoting the, the scripture correctly, but he was taking it out of context. Okay. And this is the primary thing that occurs in the false teachers, in the false prophets, is they take things out of context and created distortion, which leads to heresy or leads to delusion. It certainly leads to a dark place of evil influence. And so, so they have higher intelligence than us. 
Therefore, if we are not if we are not humble, they can easily deceive us. Okay, and this is why you always have a control. I mean, a a sanctuary, which is your church, which is your spiritual father, which is the teachings of holy orthodoxy. You never go out on law. You never do anything in Braden pride, thinking that you can overcome them. You don't do that. The saints never did that. They would take authority and charge over them, but they would never engage them on their own turf. We have to avoid their turf and what they do. Continuing in verse 1. Even as there will be false teachers among you. Now who will secretly bring in who will, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies? Now what was one of the major false teachings Saint Saint Peter had to contend with where he was at? In that in his letter. What was the major false teaching that he had to contend with? Narcissism. Okay, it's one of them. In this letter he deals with one major one though. A group yes. Chapter and verse. Okay, this is chapter 2, verse 1. Okay. Their name was antinomians. Antinomos, okay? Instead of or against the nomos, the law, okay? And, and so what happened is the antinomians whose teachings seemed close to, to Gnosticism, what were their, their, what were their dis distorted teachings? Do you know what they taught? Well, I, I kind of give you a hint because anti nomos anti law. So, so that faith alone, isolated from repentance, works, or virtue, or virtue saves. Okay, one more time. Faith alone, isolated from repentance, works, or virtues, or virtue saves. And this is actually made by or our study Bible commentator. So only, only faith is necessary. It doesn't have to be fleshed out in any activity or action. And this is one of the temptations today that we see, is people just, okay, well, I have faith in God. Well, I'm not doing anything about it, but, but I have faith, I believe. But yet, is belief really manifest if it's just an intellectual faith? No, really, because when you're put to the test, you'll cave in immediately. And this is the problem. So what did they believe about the second coming, the antinomians? What do you think? And I'm going to push your minds a little bit. Okay. Now we know that they just believed in faith, but they didn't believe actually having to live. And so, what do you think they believed about the second coming? If you had that mindset, what would you think about the second coming? Predestination. Okay. Okay. You might. Okay. You'd actually think it's not. It's not. No. You'd go against it. It's not even going to occur. No, because you're so pleasant, pleased with how you're living your own life, you don't want it to come. Okay. <laughs> Right? You know, because you're doing my faith, you're not really putting your stuff to action or anything like that. You're just doing your own thing and, and enjoying yourself. And so you don't want the second coming to come. And some people will say, Father, I don't want to see the second coming. I haven't lived my life yet. Okay? You know, I want to I want to get married, I want to have a family, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to get rich, I want to, you know, have a big house and do this and and, and yet this is not the position of the church. Church is you know it's up to the will of God. God is how God will determine when he's going to come. You know, I'd much rather be in heaven. Anybody that's experienced heaven and has had to come back to earth, what do you think they prefer? Heaven, you know, once we've experienced heaven, we want to know there's nothing else that we want. We don't want anything else. We don't want anything else. Okay, so they denied the second coming would be a physical historical event. Why? Because it wasn't comfortable with it. It didn't agree with their plan for their life. You know, and so therefore they rejected it. And people do this today with Christianity, okay? They want to go to and and take the things they like. Like Christianity is a is, is a grand buffet. Okay, what's the name of the big buffet? Golden um, Corral. Golden Corral, okay. 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 <laughs> You know, golden cream, you can get anything you want there. I mean, they got, you know, roast beef over here. They got pizza. They got 
all kinds of, you know, they got everything under the sun. And you get sick when you leave the place. <laughs> okay. But, you know, the problem is, is you can't, you have to take the faith that requires you to take everything. You just can't pick and choose what you want. Okay. You can't pick the beef strong enough and not deal with the coleslaw and the sauerkraut. You know, you need the full package. All these things are essential. Okay. And this is what Christianity was not to be meant to be one of these pick and choose things. Well, I'm going to go to uh, to uh, Chandler Christian Church because they have the best, um, you know, ten step program. Okay, or I'm going to go to a Cornerstone because I really like the singles ministry. You know, that's not where you go to church. You go to church because you're looking for truth. You're not looking for your brand of preference. It's not like a fashion statement, okay, where you're picking up a wardrobe. Yeah, it's not that way with Christianity. You know, when people went looking for the church, they didn't look for the place that had the designer clothes, okay, or or the most uh, prominent person. You know, the, they went there because the church was the church. It was there that they got the sacraments. They got the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You know. It was there they were prepared to fight, you know, the spiritual warfare of living as a Christian in the first century, Judaism, because they had to they had to confront real temptation, you know, where the Jews probably seized property. You probably lost a lot of your rights legally because you were Christian. And I guess I'm sure somebody's done a paper. I have to ask, uh, do some studies on them to see if they've done a paper on. What happened to the early first century Christians in Jerusalem? What what they had to go through in terms of a risk to limb and property and other rights and distinctions because of their professed faith in Christ. I'm sure there were many things that occurred, many difficulties because they had to follow, because they chose to follow Christ. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Okay, um, how can we detect the activity of the demons inspiring a heresy? How can we detect it? Why would the demons want to reject the doctrine or tenet of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Why would they want to reject it? Well, isn't the whole point of the second coming so, like, you prepare your, like, your soul spiritually? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, obviously, they don't want you, you know, being redeemed. So. Okay, but what? But what, what does that mean for them, though? Well, what? How does it? How does the second coming of Jesus Christ affect them? That's they, the final. What? The, the final fire. Because okay, at that point, the everlasting fire. At that point, <laughs> hell is prepared. Hades and, and and evil will be cast into the lake of fire, which is hell. Okay, and so their judgment comes in. And so that's the last thing they want to have is a discussion item. Okay? And so if there's any group if, if there's any group that rejects the second coming of Jesus Christ, you can be sure that there's demons behind it. Because the last thing the demons want to announce, proclaim, or acknowledge is the general judgment. The end of the world and the fact that they will be, be judged for eternity. They do not want to hear that. Uh, yes. But if, when they're cast, they be burned. Got to remember that they don't die; they burn for eternity. Mm -hmm. Pain for eternity; they don't die. That's true, and this is an important point. Um, when we, when our souls are rejoined to our bodies, our bodies will be reparticulated in an unperishable, um, indestructible way, where they will live forever, which means they will suffer forever if they're away from God. Okay, in the demons. They do, they do not get a new body, but their body is different than ours. Their body, bodies will, will continue to live, but they will be exposed to the pain of alienation from God. And so this is something just, you know, for clarification. So the demons know that with the second coming of Christ will come the general judgment. So they, they greatly fear this event. And that's for, important for us to know. And so we see a distort, distortion or a group that will try to reject that the fact there's a judgment. In fact, today there are many today are, that are not people are not comfortable with the idea of judgment. And and, and how do they try to what, what logic do they employ in order to do, to defend their position? 
God loves everyone, everyone will be saved. Okay. Cast out the first stone. They always bring that one up. Yeah, do not judge because <laughs> unless you be judged. Okay. And so their belief is, you know, how can a God of love <clears throat> judge anyone? And so the question then becomes, well, then how, how, how can we have all this reference to judgment and to hell and to Hades in the New Testament? Is it incorrect? See, so they don't realize that that the God they're they're trying to present in their logic, they're showing contradictions inside of it. And so they're not reading the full manuscript, putting all the verses together to get the correct understanding. That with, there is free will, there are consequences to our free will choices. And God's desire that all would be saved. But yet, we know that um, people will, some will just choose evil because they, they prefer that, because their works are dark. And so we have to <coughs> be aware of that. Are we to expect false teachers to be present in the days in which we live? Should we expect it? Sure. God, he says yes? Okay. You probably see a few in the courtroom. Okay, okay. <laughs> or we should believe themselves and believe uh, you know, the package of goods they've sold to themselves and their thinking. Okay? In, in fact, do you think that perhaps it would be more pronounced in the times we live in? Closer, yeah, closer to the end. Okay. Four of them will just be popping up everywhere. Okay. Why? People will be desperate. Okay. And they won't have God in their hearts. Okay. Without God in your heart, you become deceived by the Antichrist. Okay. If you think it's all intellectual in the brain, mm -hmm. you're lost. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the answer would be an un unequivocal yes. Do the Holy Scriptures reveal this? What do the Holy Scriptures say? Well, it says many prophets have come in my name. Okay. Yeah. And this is revealed in Matthew, you know, chapter 24. Also, in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, we hear, in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created. Elsewhere, we see this also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, where we hear, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine. And we see that today with this whole thing with, um, with um, gay marriage and, and trying to change the laws of the land and to somehow make distortion acceptable or normal. And so they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. To fables. What's fables? Fables is like a, a little story or, or mythology or, or a fabricated little cute, cute story that that everybody's supposed to believe in. And, and, and I look at, you know, those who follow Mormonism. You know, how can you, how can you embrace the Book of Mormon, which historically is so detached from reality? Because there's a lot of demons in yeah. there. Yeah, and, 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 somehow, and somehow make it uh, compatible with the Bible. And, you know, and I just I just scratched my head because if you read the two texts, you know, you can clearly see that one's not inspired. They revised and, their own book of King James. They have their own book. Well, they have to in order to make it compatible. Yeah. And whatever you have to do that, you know, and who gives permission to change the scriptures? You know, you can't. You have to go to the church. You know, and this is another sign of heresy is when you change the scriptures. When you change the, ins the inspired text. I did some research on doctrines of demons and found that just changing one word in the scriptures can change it into the doctrine of demons. Jesus Christ is the way, is the way it's supposed to be. They've changed it now to a way. So, so there's choice, there are other ways now. Many other ways yeah. to be yeah. saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, even we see with, with Islam, you know, Jesus was a good man. He was a prophet. Okay. He's one of their prophets. But yet that doesn't even conform with what, with what, um, with what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches, if Jesus says the words of God, and they call him a prophet, and Jesus says there's one way to the Father, and that's through the Son, then they have to come to grips with that statement. In fact, I remember sharing this with two uh, Islamic seminarians that were coming, you know, to a church tour once. Yeah, because they were trying to be real, real sharp and, and, and improve, uh, you know, Islam. You know, it was, was more correct than Christianity. And at that point, they had no answer. You know, they, they, what, what can you say? Is he a prophet or isn't he? You know? And if he says there's one way to the Father, that's through the Son. You know? You, know, you have to acknowledge that. And there's no room for, for Muhammad to squeeze into the picture and say, yeah, for me and Muhammad, it's to the Father. There's nothing in there that, that allows for that. So, I mean, just, you know, things to ponder. So, they will have itching ears. Their ears will be anxious. They'll heap up for themselves teachers. I love the expressions, heap up. <laughs> it's like it's like the expression of, I'm like vomiting, you know, or, or throwing out the trash, you know, a, a heap, you know, which means something that has no value. It's just, just it's like anything that doesn't matter, you know. And, and that's the case. So can you think of any t today who would fall into the category of false teachers? This, and, you know, there's probably no end to this this question, but can you think of any? Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn. Tommy Hinn. Okay, I, I, have a, I have a name for Benny Hinn. Benny Hendrick. <laughs> okay, okay. Do you, do you know the story of Benny Hinn? He was Coptic. Huh? He was Coptic Orthodox before. He was baptized by the Bishop of Jerusalem, Patriarch of Jerusalem. Yeah, he was Orthodox. <laughs> well, his head, got, his head got bigger. He was a disciple of who? Madam, uh, what was her name? Catherine Coleman. Oh, Catherine Coleman. Benny Hinn was a, a disciple of Catherine Coleman. In fact, when Catherine Coleman died, what did Benny become? Her successor. Her successor. Okay. He took over the ministry of Catherine Coleman, okay, and he left the historic faith and began to develop a whole gospel based on what? Prosperity. Huh? Prosperity. Prosperity and the Holy Spirit, okay, and to the relegation of the Father and the Son to really subservient roles because his whole emphasis was on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, huh? Holy Spirit that people like a soccer or a baseball. Yeah, and they okay. all fall over. Okay, okay. They fall over. I mean, I don't know. No. If the demons are rolling with him as he's throwing his, <laughs> yeah. his arm out and they're running through people. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a key point. Yeah. How is he able to slay people in the spirit? Have you heard of that expression? Slay being slain in the spirit? Well, and this is very common in, in the Pentecostal holiness and the tent revival ministries, where they'd lay hands upon people and they would, they would collapse underneath the power. And there are two Orthodox Russian saints, Marcinophius, and I forget his uh, sidekick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they talked about this, about how, how the devil does stuff like this. He, they talk about pushing people over, and they talk about laughter, uncontrolled laughter. Animal sounds. Yeah, and animal sounds, okay? And how this is demonic. And so, but you wouldn't know this unless you were part of the, the historic church, okay? And, you know, this, and it seems so captivating what they're doing, you know? And yet some people pledge to get well. How can the devil feign healings? How can he do that? Mary, what do you think? If the devil wanted to confuse a group of people, how would he feign the healing of a person? Well, does he actually have the power to uh, appear like someone's healed, but yet there's some drawbacks on it? Yeah, yeah. 
the demons can actually lift a person up who is crippled. Did you know that? Do you know they can do that? Yeah, they can lift a person up. They can give them a sense of, of, of things are well. There is a scripture about the weight of glory. Yeah. The, about speaking of the Holy Spirit, can yeah. you define that compared to the weight that these people are falling and falling like they're saying there's a glory? Well, yeah, there's um okay, there's a difference here. You know, um where the presence of God is like heavy and but yet it's different. It's soothing, it's refreshing. It doesn't, you know, knock someone over, you know, where you know, where they're they lose consciousness, okay? There's a difference. And so the key thing is 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 that the demons will even be able to deceive the very elect through their cleverness. But they do they cannot perform miracles, so they are deceiving in some way. Deception. Yeah, they're, they're not, not they're not, yeah, they can't do miracles, authentic miracles. But they can give a sense of false healing. In so, fact, there have been many that have recidivism back to their old illnesses. They've done st um, studies and stuff like that. So they're doing something about um, perceptions that are clouding perceptions yeah. in some way. Yeah. Remember, the demons are the masters of, of, of using light and imitation. Yeah, right? imitation they're of light. Masters yeah. of, of yeah. imitating. And that's why they're called deceivers, deceptive. Okay. They're good at it. And so, yes. And going along with that idea, it's also used to, useful to remember that a lot of these miracles are also just staged. Like a lot of them are just audience plans or yeah. people sympathetic to it. And it can also be psychosomatic where someone thinks they're being healed and they get better or someone thinks they, uh, they're they experiencing the Holy Spirit and they start just babbling because they've heard other people babble. So, yeah, um, so but I, I would never outlaw or out. Uh, I would never say that there's never demonic activity. There's always demonic activity with these sorts of things, but um, mm. it's worth remembering that along with the authentic um, manifestations of demonic activity, there's also just plants, people. Um, yeah, and I know they, uh, Peter Popoff was still on the re on TV on Sundays. Um, and he would, he was actually a master of going out to the parking lots and getting license plates and doing you know information back checks on people. And there was another two, I think, uh, there were several that did this too. Because, you know, if you have people's names, you could, then you had their, their file, you knew information about them. But, you know, wow, you know, this is really something. But these things occur, they happen. And so we have to be very careful. And, and so you have to look at the lives of these people and where they put their value. And whether the virtues are, is there authentic humility? And you see an absence. You see things that are that are not there. Continuing. Well, there, and all of them will deny apostolic succession. You know, because all of them will buy into this thing called prophetic succession, that they are a successor of the spirit of Catherine Coleman or the ministry, and it's been passed on to them prophetically. To them. And this is how they justify their ministries. Okay? And yet this is not the way of the historic church. This is not how the church developed or spread to our present day. There was no, there were prophets in the church, they always submitted themselves to the apostles. There was no freelancing going on. You know, somebody just decided, well, I'm gonna to go to town instead of a tent, and I'm gonna lay my hands on people because I have the gift of healing. That's not how it worked, you know. People were, were humbled, they sent themselves to the authorities of the church, and they showed humility. And they did not try to do, um, you know, to display with great, you know, uh, attention their gifts and ministries. Okay, um, we see, especially these false teachers as founders and uh, dogmatic founders of many of the, of, of the Protestant faiths. You know, and as we said, Benny Hinn. Joel Olstein, what's his distortion? Prosperity gospel. Huh? Prosperity. He's been gifted with good teeth. Prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel, okay. You know, kind of a... You just look yeah. at his house. Have you seen it? Yeah. No, I, I, I never got an invite. It's on the internet. Lutheran satire, if you're, if you're uh, what was it? 
if your if your faith uh, if it sounds silly for the the saints to be uh, saying your your uh, your doctrine, then that's not a real faith or something like that. And of course, there's a Lutheran yeah. satire, but anyway, it was it mm -hmm. was funny. A video where they had martyrs read Joel yeah. Osteen tweets. Yes, yeah. and it just so it's like John the Baptist being beheaded and saying, you know, God has a wonderful plan for your life and. Yeah. Sorry, no. It's actually a very good video. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. so it's kind of random, but yeah, okay. just remind me of Oh, Freddie Prince. Have you seen Freddie Prince? Isn't he one of the jets? There are quite a few of them that have the several, you know, multi-million dollar jets. Pro yeah, Freddie. Yeah, because he's also an adherent to the wealth gospel. Okay. And, and what does he preach? That if you're not wealthy, what's the problem? Like, it's with you, you know. Well, you know, if, yet he's got all these poor people in his church. You know, and, and you know, you know, who must really hate themselves because they're going to this place to be told, you know, that, that they got a problem. Hey, why are you doing the wealthy gospel? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you just very wrong. <laughs> we can't always pick correctly. True. Okay. Okay, now, um, you know, and I've had, uh, you know, I've had Keith work on this, this, this new popular church development that's occurring in the Protestant milieu called the Progressive Church. Tell us about the Progressive Church. It's, um, in some ways, it's sort of the way theology has been going for a really long time. You had um, the liberal movement where people started questioning the Bible, started questioning church history and that sort of thing. And then now it's just sort of accepted, um, aspects of like the progressive movement politically where gay marriage is okay, transsexuality is okay, um, not just allowed but also celebrated. Um, so a lot of the, the really big Protestant denominations in this country, um, a lot of the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists are really buying into this um, and it's it just, it, it's a Christianity that denies anything difficult about it. There's no ascetic struggle. There's no, um, anything that's popular is okay. Um, no denying thyself, take up thy problem. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's no sense of, um, sense of giving, there's no sense of sacrifice. There's no sort of, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's hard to like summarize it because it's such a huge distortion, but oh. um, yeah, it's just a, a uh, a Christianity without the cross, without sin, without judgment. Without, there's without no judgment. judgment. Exactly. There's no judgment, and there's just uh, love. Love is the answer. It's love is the, is the is the pinnacle thing of their of their church. And not even a true love. It's, yeah. it's a love that doesn't ask the first person to change. It's yeah. It's very selfish. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of yeah. things. You're okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Just love one another. Well, they make make things in law and society. Mm -hmm. It's all about money because they can make money, they can make taxes. Yeah. It's all okay mm -hmm. because it's the law. That's right. That's right. Okay, so you know, we, Charles Stace Russell, the, the founder of the, the Jehovah Witnesses, okay? It, their distortion. Um, Joseph Smith of the Mormons. Herbert W. Armstrong of the Wide World Church of God. These are all founded by people who, who did not have apostolic succession, but felt that they somehow had a right. He's not my relative. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and can you think of other religions that also have this same spurious, deceptive type of founding? What about those independent churches? Um, all of them have the distortion in that they that they. They believe that they can have existence because they like Jesus. And they, and they feel like they don't have to have any connection with any other church in order to have a church. So there's no apostolic succession, no power traceable to an apostle, to a bishop, to the priest, or to the historic church. No acceptance of the doctrine of the church. And no embracing of the worship of the church, you know, how the church worships. Can you say, like, uh, modern-day Judaism because of the Kabbalah and the Talmud? That was after Christ. Well, you know that's uh, even kind of taboo for for like Jews, Orthodox Jews. You know, they the Kabbalah is kind of this this uh, spurious material that's out there on the edge. You know, and it's kind of taking like Judaism to another place. 
yeah, you know, you'll have um, the Mishnah and other books that they will are more acceptable. And so, yeah, there are distortions within Judaism, you know, kind of their own Reformed Jews. And, and, and so even they have evolved into something different, which, is, which wasn't uh, inspired. So what would be, um, in, so what other religions can you think of that where you can see where it's totally not based on, on God, the Holy Trinity? Scientology. Huh? Scientology. What else? Uh, yeah. How about the Sikhs? The Sikhs, okay. okay. Islam. Huh? Islam. Islam, Hindu. you know. A false appearance by the Archangel Gabriel. The Baha'is, okay. Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses. Okay. Um, the Self Realization Fellowship, Central Avenue. Bethany, I'll make it this place up there. Oh. Self Realization <laughs> Fellowship. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about the Lutheran? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lutheran, okay, now Lutheran is a mainline Protestant church. They all are off base because they're founded by the personality of one person who was broken off from the from the church and so this would be the fails in lutherism is that they have broken off from apostolic succession at what point you'll have to go back to well luther was connected he was a catholic he was a catholic priest okay by the way the catholics offer offered to make him a cardinal if he would uh, submit <laughs> along with uh, the program of Rome. Did you know that? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. yeah, okay. So what happens is Luther is, is a break off for the line. First of all, the Catholics have reached great schism in 1054 with the Orthodox. And so Lutherism breaks off of Catholicism, 1560. Okay. And so Lutherism is two breaks later, okay? So they're disconnected from the historic church. Oh, they have many, you know, now I want to say there are many good people that are Lutheran. There are many good people in all these churches, but you have to look at the theology. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're judging. We're not judging people here. Okay. You, you guys come from some Lutheran background too before you became our, our cities. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry this is off base, Father. Yeah, it's okay. But earlier, when during the uh, inquirers class, yeah. you mentioned uh, the first schism with yeah. the, uh, I think, I believe they're Oriental Orthodox? The Oriental churches, the uh, anti Chaldeans, which occurred around 450, 550 AD. Yes, and you mentioned that there's great steps in reading my. Yeah, yeah. What does that say about it, having so long away from. Well, Kingdom? basically, what happened, this group is the. Is the uh, Jacobites, the Copts, the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, the Armenians, and the Indian Church, okay, of Syria, okay. And so <clears throat> these are the Coptic or Monophysitic Church, or Monophysitic or anti Chaldean churches. And basically, their difference is how to understand the event of the conception of Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Did Jesus' divine nature, which before his incarnation was the pre eternal Word of God, did that somehow absorb the human nature that was that was uh, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit? Did it become one nature, or did it remain two distinct natures? The Church said they had two distinct natures: the human nature of Christ, which was fully God, fully man, and the divine nature, which was fully God, eternal Holy of God. Although His humanity was created in time. Okay. So the Church maintains the position that there are two natures in Christ. And also two wills, a human will and a divine will. And so it's important for us to to realize that. Because if Jesus Christ was not fully human, then he does not really know what it's like to be tempted and be respected in the flesh as you and I. Therefore, he would not be sympathetic or present a realistic possibility for us to live holiness in our humanity. Okay, And that's why we have to submit or commune or participate in his divine nature in his human nature in order for us to be elevated or purified to overcome the passions. And if he wasn't 100% divine too, then we're not saved because only God can save man. Uh, did you get all that? <laughs> okay. yep. oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just rambling here. Wow. So what we do. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Yes. Okay, the old calendarist, the, the, this is the old calendarist. The old calendarist, um, there's a movement 
that happened around 1921 in Greece, in which the ecumenical patriarch made a decision, he made an agreement with uh, some uh, countries in Europe in order to move the fixed feast days of the church uh, to a different calendar. It was more in, in harmony with the Western calendar. And so what happened, if these days like, could he still, you know, Christmas was moved from January 7th to December 25th. By the way, in the West, it was always celebrated on December 25th. Why? Because the feast day was developed in um, in the early centuries in order to counter the worship of the sun god at Rome. And so the early, it was all Rome said we will do the, do the feast day of Christmas on December 25th in order to get them away from the pagan worship to the worship. So what happens is several of the patriarchs accepted the decisions of the ecumenical patriarch and they embraced the new calendar for the feast days of the fixed feast days of the calendar year. But Pascha, they all, both the Paleo Ibarolifis, the old calendars, and the newer on the same Paschal calendar. So for 40% of the, 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 the church year, we are on the same calendar. It means from the from the first uh, from pre-Lenten all the way through the Feast of All Saints in June, we're on the same worship with the old calendars. And the old calendars say you can't change the fixed days, but yet there's no canon that says that. The canon says you cannot change the date of Pascha. You have to go by Nicaea, which said that the that the date of Pascha can only be determined by four or five things. It has to come after the spring equinox. It has to come after the Jewish Passover. It has to come after the first full moon after the Jewish Passover, after the spring equinox. It cannot come before April 3rd. So all these things become the measurements of determine when we celebrate Pascha. Now the Western calendar, which is based upon the uh, Gregorian calendar, as opposed to us who have the Julian calendar, uh, will have times where, where they will celebrate Easter before the Jews have even celebrated Passover. Okay. Now, obviously it creates a problem for us because there are times where we're not going to experience Pascha until the first week in May. This will happen every three or four years. So there is a need for something, but the only way this could possibly occur is the whole church would have to come together and say, look, Okay. Actually, technically, both calendars are incorrect. Yeah. The Julian calendar is incorrect, and the Gregorian calendar is incorrect, technically. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's that's for another another evening. But are they cut uh -huh. off, or are they, do they have succession the old calendar? Uh, if they judge the new calendar and say the new calendar is not the church, then they fall into heresy. Okay. If they are a standoff group where they recognize the validity of the sacraments, and then then, you know, as long as they recognize. See, uh, even in this country, we have several parishes underneath the Greek Archdiocese of, of North of, of America that are old calendars, and the Archbishop allows them to keep their calendar. And yet they recognize that we have, we're the same church. Okay. And so I think that's important, is that we don't get lost in the detail. Um, a, a famous, uh, I mean, a, a famous, uh, Romanian saint said that the calendar will not save us. Okay, okay. <laughs> only Jesus will save us. The old calendar will not save us. The new calendar will save us. Only, only Christ will save us. Amen. Continuing. Okay, so what we have is uh, we have all kinds of groups behind Self Realization Fellowship. Lord Maitreya. Remember the Lord Maitreya movement about ten years ago. Remember how he was going to reveal himself in London. And he was supposed to be the fulfiller of some of, of some um, messianic figure. Okay, this was very, you probably missed this in the 1980s, 1990s, okay. Um, then you have, uh, have you ever seen the book of Urandia? Okay, tell us what Urandia is about. <laughs> um, it's someone... The, the, the people who support it say it was written by, I think, extra, actually extraterrestrials or angels. Who communicated to a person over a period of right. months or years. I thought he like, was writing like, 
like asleep but writing the yeah. Sea Rancho book. Yeah. Um, it's really weird. There's a lot of alien stuff in it. They say Jesus like was one of these angels or extraterrestrials <coughs> or something. It's very like New Age, very mm-hmm. I don't know, just kind of weird stuff in general. So mm-hmm. weird. And, the, and there are numerous books like this that are out there, okay? And the reason I bring this up is to show you uh, the vast expanse of of trash, okay? <laughs> of, of just spiritual garbage that's out there that people buy, they buy into, okay? And so the words of St. Paul II, you know, you know uh, Timothy about, you know, they will not give heed to sound doctrine are words that resonate as true in our very day. We see this happening. And, it's, and, it, and we just shake our heads and people are accepting anything today. Have, do you realize that? You know, anything's okay? Okay? You know, uh, what's his name that comes out and, re- and reveals that he's a transvestite? Okay. My hero. Okay. Bruce Jenner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, so yeah, he's having an identity crisis. You know, I mean, but yet is that approved by God? Would God want that? Does that please God? Okay. Do same-sex marriages please God? Do they feel? Does that feel right? But Father, it's not. That's not showing sensitivity to somebody that struggles with this passion. Well, I, I'm I'm saddened, but I'm sorry too. I mean, you know, just because we have a hard cross doesn't mean that, you know, that it's okay. Well, I think Saint Paul even talks about. In scripture where men give themselves to men and women give themselves to women, God leaves them alone to that passion. Because yeah. that's what they want. Yeah. Over the truth. Okay. Isn't it super important to hate the sin but not the sinner? Because anyone can be redeemed. You have to love everybody, but you but the thing is, you know, the problem is they'll say, Well, you don't love me if you don't accept, you know, that I'm this way. And that's not true. Yeah. I love you, but I can't acknowledge that sin is good for anybody. Okay. I've heard over and over again stories where people, like uh, just a couple of uh, stories where the guy will say, I'm going to kill myself if you, you know, I'm a homosexual, I'm going to kill myself, and the parents fold under, and they go, no, I don't want you to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And then then that's kind of, why do they go into that? It seems like that's a a reoccurring story. Well, I mean, the the sad thing is is, is, it's it's a a very difficult struggle for them. Most of them, most of the struggles we deal with are sexuality and learning how to control passions. True. And yet it, it, it's a life of prayer. It's a life of, of just of fighting and, and of submitting you know, to the will of God and, and struggling. And there are victories in it. You know, people get through it and they become sanctified. But it's not easy. Why? Because we're dealing with our, our distorted human nature after the fall. And so, therefore, we're exposed to a full gamut of distortion, and we, you know, we have to take authority over them, and we have to expel the evil that's involved in them that, that synergizes to make us go deeper into the passion. And because society has made everything so acceptable, and and we're supposedly compassionate, you know, it allows people to choose their own demise. And therefore, when you try to speak against that, you're insensitive. But I think the greater insensitivity is to say everything's okay. Well, They're, uh, yeah. You're doing it to their own children, too. Now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, okay. Okay, now, mind you, if you have a friend that is dealing with this, you love them in Christ. Okay? And you encourage them to fight. Just encourage them to fight. And if they need to talk to you, let them talk. Encourage them. You know. What if they don't, don't want to fight? Huh? What if they don't want to fight? Well, you encourage them to do so. Okay. At some point, you know, if it's if it's if you know, sometimes you have to cross, you have to depart paths. You know, in order just to. But you still be there as a Christian when they call. You have to. You have to. You have to. And 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 the key thing is is. Uh, we don't have to create a movement where you go out and condemn people. That's not the Christian way. We, but yet it's our duty and love to protect the best that we can and to encourage. You know, we're into this encouragement ministry of encouraging people to make the right choices and and offering you know to to be a, you know a, a helper 
you know, uh, confident that in order to get encouragement. I think that's half of it. It's just having somebody encourage us to do the right thing. If we didn't have the right people in our lives encouraging us to make certain choices, you know, we'd probably all be in trouble. Yes? Well, this, it, this hits home. Mm -hmm. We all have someone in our family or loved one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say is they say to still love them no matter what mm -hmm. they are. Yeah. Right? How I love them, I don't judge them, and I love them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. But the, what I want them to know is their soul mm -hmm. is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And I'm scared for their soul. Well, this is the hard thing, is that we have to, and this is this is what motivates us to, to be a support as we can, okay? Because we do love, we, we don't hate anybody, okay? And believe me, under the right precipitating circumstances, you and I can do anything. Okay? Right distortions, you and I can have mimicking any type of sexual distortion out there, believe me. You know? And there are enough temptations and, and things out there, you know, to, to, to help us along that path. Father, can you uh, repeat a little bit of what you said at the chrismation about the church? Okay, um, we had a chrismation this week. A uh, very fine young uh, middle aged gentleman uh, converted. To orthodoxy from Catholicism. Um, and I gave a little message after the chrismation, and I assured, I reminded the new convert that he was not, he was in a perfect church in terms of doctrine, but in terms of the body of Christ here, we have many people of very different levels of sickness and wellness that are in the congregation. You're going to find the worst sinners and the best saints in the same parish and not to be discouraged because you see them because the church is a hospital for all people okay? and we need the hospital we need the sacraments we need communion we need confession you know we need forgiveness and we need role models and examples of people using the gifts God has given them in order to, to build the body of Christ here at St. Catherine and yet the reality is, is there are people that aren't going to go along with the prescription that the priest gives in order for their salvation. They're going to just occupy space and do what they do. But I pray that through osmosis and by being there long enough that the light bulb will go off and that will change. You never know what sings out. Yeah, you never know. Never give up. And, I, you know, and I've worked with people with all different types of struggles and issues and, and I've seen I've seen change. I've seen improvement in all categories. Closing prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I Lord, we can do no good thing without you. You are the source of life. And therefore, we come before you and we implore that you would give us life. Help us, Lord, to become life bearers to those in a dying world. Help us, Lord, to be the conduit that will connect people to you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your goodness. We pray for those that, that are captured by their passions, that your mercy would reach them, and that we could be a source of comfort and healing for them. Lord, be with us as we go forth this evening, as we face new challenges, as we face difficulties and uncertainties in the times we live. Please help us to know that you are the stability of our lives, that in you we find all the things that we need in order for, for personal happiness. We ask all these things in your name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.